We're continuing through Luke and lessons that we're learning from our Lord. This morning we look at the whole concept of forgiveness. And how much does forgiveness, how much does the concept of being forgiven stir my heart? How much time, how much does it grab us where we live? And, and how much does it affect our lives? You know, there are, there are worship songs that we sing there are hymns that we sing, and, you know, and can it be, uh, it is well with my soul, the power of the cross, uh, how deep the Father's love for us. I, I hope I hear both of those songs tonight by the people that wrote them. I sing those songs, and, and, and seriously, when I sing those songs and focus on the meaning, I can't help but get teary-eyed. It stirs in my heart because I realize that I don't deserve one one bit of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has bestowed upon me by His grace through my faith. I don't deserve it. And we're looking this morning at a concept of forgiveness as is recorded in the Gospel of Luke that, that should impact our lives. Now, a couple of thoughts as we get started, as we get into this this morning. There's a research thing that I read and I found it interesting. A research team showed the words chocolate cake to a group of Americans and recorded their word associations, and the number one choice was guilt. Now, if that strikes you as interesting, consider the response of a group of French people. Same word, chocolate cake, celebration. Different perspective. And guilt can be complicated. Forgiveness can be complicated, too. Because many people struggle with a sense of personal guilt. Psychologists, counselors, pastors know it because we hear from people, realize that that is one of the biggest issues that we find when we deal with people when they're struggling over things. When you boil it down and get down to the very bottom, you find out there's some sense of guilt deep inside of there. And they desperately desire to find forgiveness. How do I find and feel forgiven? And on the other side of the fence, many people, those of us sitting in this room for the most part, maybe every single one of us, are fully forgiven by God's grace, received by faith. But we aren't always fully able to appreciate the magnitude, the immense power of forgiveness. Why do I know we can't appreciate it? Because we're not very good at forgiving each other. And that's another sermon for another time. But the ability to appreciate the magnitude of being forgiven, and you know what? I, I, hey, thanks for the texts and, and the emails in the last couple of weeks. You've appreciated the fact that I brought Charlie back to, to, to church on Sundays. A little Charlie this morning. Here's Lucy. Oh, Lucy. She says to Snoopy here, sign this. And it absolves me from all guilt, she says. So she goes to her brother. Sign this. It absolves me from all guilt. She says, thank you, because he signs it. She goes to Beethoven, the great, and says, sign this. It absolves me from all guilt. And then she goes to, uh, is that Patty? And uh, she uh, says, sign this, and it absolves me from all guilt. And she signs it and says, thank you. And there's this question mark in her mind. She comes to Charlie, and she says, hey, sign this. It absolves me from all guilt. And he says, I don't understand. She says, sign it. Just sign it. That's, that's right. Thank you. And then it's, she, she reads it out loud. She says, no matter what happens any place or any time in the world, this absolves me from all guilt. What's Charlie's response? He says, that, might be a, that must be a nice document to have. And the reality is, is, is there's humor in that, but we don't laugh because it's humor that recognizes a truth. We want to be absolved from all responsibility, from all blame, from all guilt. And it's not always easy. Now we move on, and here she is with her brother, and he expresses with his blanket and his thumb, he says, 
Why are you always so anxious to criticize me? She makes this profound statement. She says, I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. So he says, what about your own faults? He says, I have a knack for overlooking them. You laughed. You know what? That's a nice document to have too. And the reality is, it all revolves around the fact that forgiveness is complicated. And as we look at it this morning, we're going to see in this passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, that God's forgiveness, the fact that God has, boom, from heaven, reached down to forgive, that is a glorious and a gracious gift that we receive. And yet, we go through life day in and day out, and you know what? It becomes mundane. It becomes easy to take for granted. The reality of being forgiven should impact and increase our desire to give glory and honor to God all the time. I, I admit this morning just a tiny bit of a fault of my own to some extent when I say a fault it's, this, I'm not, this isn't a confession session I've always been leery of people that walk around saying praise the Lord to God be the glory I've been leery of that why because as a pastor I've been burned by some of those people but you know what there's something to our expression of praise and glory to God that ought to be there all the time. And I think we need to be more intentional in expressing the fact that, God, you deserve glory. You deserve praise. You deserve every ounce of honor that I can ever give to you. Why? Because he forgave us. And that is such a glorious and gracious gift. Now we're looking at chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And we're going to walk through the passage like we've been doing over the last few weeks. I'll give a few editorial comments or, or expository comments. And then we're going to look very, very deeply at application this morning because the application is, is necessary, especially here. Because what we find here is that at the very beginning, the first four verses, there is the introduction of a very awkward situation. One of those places, one of those times when I don't know without realizing what the passage is teaching if I'd have wanted to have been in the room at the time. And I'm going to be as close to the text as I possibly can be. I'm almost reading the text as I go through this. Jesus was invited for dinner at a Pharisee's house. The text says he entered and he reclined at the table. While he's seated at the table, a certain woman, not women, I have typo there, a certain woman from the city who was known as a sinner. Let me just stop and, and pull back for a moment and say, urban legend says she was a prostitute. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We don't know what sin she was involved in. Others say, well, that's Mary Magdalene. No, it was not Mary Magdalene. It was a woman from the city. I believe this was probably Capernaum because that was where Jesus placed his headquarters in Galilee. This woman from the city known as a sinner. It says explicitly, she was a sinner. Heard that Jesus was seated at the Pharisee's house. She entered bringing an expensive, extravagant bottle of perfumed oil. Standing behind Jesus at his feet, she kneels down. She was weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. And at the same time, she was anointing his feet with perfume. 
and in a way that showed great reverence and great respect for him, for he was a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was great in this woman's eyes, to say the least. She was kissing his feet over and over and over again. When the Pharisee saw this, Pharisee's name was Simon, the text tells us that. When Jesus addressed him, when the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, if this man is a true prophet, if this guy is who people say that he is, he would know exactly who and what kind of woman, what kind of person this woman is who is touching him. And he emphasized the word touching him. Why? Because touch defiled. And when a sinner would touch a Pharisee, a Pharisee would go and ceremonially cleanse himself based on the rules and the regulations that the rabbinical law had set. Not what the Old Testament said, but what rabbinical law, the laws that they brought about to make themselves appear and seem more holy. Whenever they were touched or when they would touch something, they would have to ceremonially cleanse themselves. So this Pharisee saying, hey, if this guy is who he says that he is or that people say that he is, he wouldn't be so, so relaxed sitting there allowing this woman to touch him. That's defiling him. And that's exactly what the Pharisee was thinking. That's what he was saying at that point in time. So we come to the next section, verses 40 through 46, where we are not now seeing the awkward situation as much now as we're seeing a twist in the awkward situation. Maybe I, I said that incorrectly. We are seeing another awkward situation develop where in fact we are identifying an attitude of self-righteousness. An attitude that strikes every single one of us from time to time. But in this case, Jesus is identifying and Jesus responded to Simon's thoughts. He responded, he knew what he was thinking. And Jesus responded to his thoughts by saying, Simon, I have something important to tell you. In fact, you can see the awkwardness developing. Jesus is invited into this Pharisee's house. There are other people around the table. Simon's, Simon's either got that look on his face or that he's, he's got whatever, but Jesus could read his thoughts anyway. And he says, hey, Simon... I got something to tell you, and you need to listen up. And Simon responded in a very kind, courteous way. He says, well, go ahead, say it, teacher. You've got the floor. You can say what you want to say. So Jesus began with an illustration, a sense of a parable, but it doesn't say that it's a parable. He gave an illustration. He told a story, and then he asked Simon a very penetrating question. The story? There's a money lender, a bank, a credit union, a sugar daddy, so to speak. Had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other one owed him 50. A denarii is a day's wage. It is a day's wage. So therefore, 500 denarii, that's, especially for the Jews, you realize the Jewish work year, the amount of work that a Jew could do in a year, the number of days they could work, that's two and a half years. 500 denarii. That's two and a half years. They could work about 200 days a year. And the other one owed him 50. When they were both unable to pay their debts, this lender graciously, and the text expresses it, uses one of the terms that the Bible uses for forgive. We'll explain those terms in a little bit. 
graciously forgave each of them. You're free of debt. You don't owe me anything. They could have said, this isn't the year of Jubilee because that was when all the debts were set free. But it wasn't. They just basically said, you can't pay me? You're okay. No problem. So Jesus asked the penetrating question to the Pharisees, is which one of them would love the lender most? And Simon answered in a rather uncertain way. The text implies that he kind of stuttered and stammered a little bit as he's answering that question. Uh, 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 I suppose. Well, maybe. Well, I'd probably say the one that was forgiven the most. And, and I, I sensed that the uncertainty in the Pharisee's voice was not because the answer was so difficult. But it was because the answer was so difficult to take. And then Jesus says, you've judged correctly. You've judged correctly. correctly. And then gesturing toward the woman, he's speaking to Simon, but he's pointing toward the lady. And, and, and get the picture here. Let me describe the scene too. In that day and age when you would recline at the table, your feet would be kind of behind you. The table would be here. You'd be reclining and, and you'd be sitting in an awkward way. That's the way they did it. And I don't know why they sat that way. I guess they didn't have backs on their chairs or something, you know. But, but Jesus is pointing to the lady who's behind him, washing his feet, and he's speaking to Simon. And he asks, in a sense, you know what, this is, I'm not going to accuse Jesus of doing anything dumb. But this is a very strange question. Because of course this guy saw this woman. Do you see this woman, he says? Do you notice her? You know what Jesus is doing right then and there? He's saying to Simon, he says, this lady is an example for you to follow. You're judging her, but she's an example for you to follow. Because without waiting for Simon to react or to respond to Jesus' question, he continued by saying, I've come into your house today, but you've given me no water to wash my feet. Common courtesy in that day and age. However, she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them, not with a towel, but with her hair. You failed to greet me with the normal greeting of a kiss when I came in the door. But she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in here. You didn't anoint my head with oil like is usually the practice. But she anointed my feet with perfume. Jesus concluded these comments to Simon and said, based on all of this, based on what I see here, based on what I've just said to you, based on what this lady is doing, I want to make this very clear to you. He's not speaking to her. He's speaking to Simon. Her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Her expression of love is great because she realizes she has been forgiven for so much. But anyone who thinks that he has very little reason to be forgiven does not express very much love. That's the end of verse 46. We come to verse 47 through 50. And we find here instructions that deal with the assurance of salvation. And it's not nearly as theological as what that may sound, but it is theological. Because what we find here is then Jesus spoke to the woman he spoke directly to her and he told her what he had just said to Simon. He says, your sins have been forgiven. And I want to point out that that is a confirmation of the Lord's identity. Remember last week we looked at John the Baptist and his questions about, Jesus, you're not meeting my expectations. Something's wrong here. 
Should we look for someone else? Are you really the Messiah or not? Why don't you show yourself the Messiah? Well, right here, Jesus identified himself as the Messiah. He identified himself as holy God. He identified himself as having the authority to forgive sins. And that confirmation of the Lord's identity was not given to Simon so much as it was given to a woman. A woman with great faith. Faith that she was able, the faith that he was able to forgive her. She was seeking forgiveness and she found it in the forgiver, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now, what does that do? That raises controversy and confusion in the room. Because the other people around the table, they sit there and say to themselves, oh man, who is this? Who is this man who also forgives sins? And as we just read the text in our, in our Bibles, we can look at it and say, well, maybe they were inquiring in a positive way, but they weren't. There was nothing positive about this. They weren't thinking to themselves, hey, we found the Messiah. No, they're saying, ah, another thing we can charge him with. And it shows that in that day and age there was great confusion and controversy surrounding the identity of our Lord. And that was expressed by people who didn't believe they actually needed forgiveness. Expressed by people thinking that they were good enough. People thinking that they were better than this lady that was weeping and washing the, fa the Savior's feet. And they figured, Phew, we're better than that lady. Again, Jesus spoke only to the woman. He looks her square in the eye. At least that's what the text implies to me. And he says, your faith. And I made the statement earlier, it gets theological. The theological thinkers look at this passage and they say, wait a minute, this is a twisted gospel. No, it's not. Jesus affirmed the fact that no, it was straight. Because he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Saved there, literally that Greek word means delivered from the penalty of sin. Recognize here, this is before Jesus died. This is before the sacrifice was accomplished. And he's already declared here, past tense, your faith has saved you. And what is that? And that is a perfect peace and absolute assurance because full forgiveness is, is available. He goes on and says to the lady, go in peace, or to say it in a more explicit, expanded way, may you have that sense of assurance and peace as you go your way. It's possible if Jesus was speaking Hebrew at that point in time that he merely said, Shalom. Because Shalom literally meant, may peace be yours every day of your life. May the well-being of God's presence be upon you the rest of your life. May you sense peace and assurance as you work your way through the rest of this culture. And as I said, it's a perfect peace. It's an absolute assurance because of full forgiveness that comes from a gift of grace received by a sinner who totally trusted in the Lord. She totally trusted in Jesus Christ. And 
the Bible doesn't say this at this point in time, but we know from other passages of Scripture there's only one way that she knew that, and that was because God the Father had revealed to this lady exactly the path of forgiveness for her and for all of us. And as we zero in now on some applications, look at some things in a, in a way that should penetrate our lives, I first have, in fact, there's, there's two sets of these this morning, and they're all tying... They all tie together. For those of you that sometimes say, you know what, I wish you'd just stop with the first one because I want to think about that one. No, they're all going to be connected. You're going to see it all together today. Because we have five relevant realities about finding forgiveness. Things that should affect the way we live day in and day out. And in a sense, we're emphasizing the conclusion that this passage is forcing us it's telling us, evaluate your personal perspective on the whole concept of forgiveness. Ask yourself, how important is it that you sense forgiveness? What is your reaction? What is your response? And what is your responsibility in view of the fact that you've been forgiven? Let me just comment here and, and, and explain a little bit of what's in the text here for a few moments. There are two Greek words that are often used in the New Testament for forgiveness. Both words are used in this passage. Both of them are used, both of them are emphasized in this passage. The first of these words literally emphasizes the main idea of granting something beneficial to another person that he or she has not earned. And as I said, the idea of forgiving one another, the idea of ex expressing forgiveness to other people, that's another sermon for another time, which we have to do sometime. There's no question about that. But God's forgiveness is described in the Scriptures as something that is granted to us that is beneficial, and yet we've not earned it. And it's also strongly describing the concept of releasing or canceling a debt. When we moved here, we sold our house that we lived in before. We went to the mortgage company, and because of the, the transaction that was being made, it was a for sale by owner and whatnot, we went to the, to, to the mortgage company and we paid them the rest of our mortgage. It was a small amount, actually. Praise God for that. But when we paid it, they, they said, okay, you'll be receiving two things in the mail. You'll be receiving a deed that shows that the house is completely yours now. You'll be receiving a statement that says that you no longer owe us for this for this debt. It's canceled because it's paid. Well, our debt to God because of our sin is canceled and paid, but we didn't pay it. We didn't deserve it. And that's what this is talking about. The second word, also in this passage, involves letting go or abandoning any and all claims that might be against an individual. And additionally, it provides a word picture of leaving something behind and not looking back. When it says in the Psalms, and it says it more than a dozen times in the Psalms, that God says to the redeemed, to those that have trusted Him for salvation, your sin is in the past and I remember it no more. God has turned His back on my sin and said, it's done. When it says in Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. 
Amen. No condemnation. I don't have to worry about standing before the judgment and saying, hey, you sinned here on September 24th. And I didn't forgive that one. I don't have to worry about that because it's done. There is no condemnation. And when I stop and think of that, I think, wait a minute now. Because likely, especially since I'll be driving in Chicago traffic tomorrow, I'm going to sin again. <laughs> and yet God says, there is therefore no, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But now the question, how do these ideas impress us regarding the way that God has provided for us the opportunity to be forgiven? Does that grab at your soul today? Does that penetrate your heart? Does that make you say, oh, wow. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. And as we celebrate that, that's not some time where we just come together and say, oh, this is a great thing to do. No, it's a reminder. A very special, sacred reminder of what Christ did to forgive us. And I have to ask this question as we move toward the end of the message here. In a room this size, this number of people, it's likely there could be individuals this morning that are here. That maybe you do a good job of playing church. Maybe you do a good job of playing the game. Maybe you don't do as good of a job as you think you do. Maybe you have a self-righteous attitude. Maybe you look at others as if you're better than they are. You may be doing ministry. You may be involved right smack in the middle of ministry, and yet there could be that sense of forgiveness. Yeah, I'm forgiven. So what? Is forgiveness a genuine reality in my life? We've got to ask ourselves that. Have I come to the cross and said, Jesus Christ, you died for my sins here at the cross of Calvary. You were buried. You were resurrected on the third day. And now you're seated at the throne of God and I accept you. I trust you. I depend on you. I depend on the work that you did for me to take care of my salvation. We are saved by grace, undeserved, through faith, I trust 100% totally on what Christ has done for me. Basically, it's time for a heart check. A heart check. Some questions, again. Am I more like Simon the Pharisee? I, mean, I like the people around the table. Who is this man? Or am I like the unnamed woman who anointed Jesus' feet with reverence and respect for him? Do I come to him with a sense of humility and says, God, I'm nothing. I can do nothing. But I come to you because you paid the price for my sins. I ran across this. Actually, it was a sign that I couldn't download and print here because of some of the rules on... It's not a copyright issue. It was just a rule on this particular website where I was. But whenever you begin to, whenever you begin to think your life is too difficult or unfair, pause and think about a man who was nailed through his hands and feet to a cross with iron spikes. And before, he was, before that, he was whipped and he wore a crown of, of, made of thorns. He committed no crime. 
No sin. But His blood was used to pay for our sins. As we look at that, realize those five relevant realities about forgiveness. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation. It is the absolute foundation of forgiveness. In this passage, the, the, the woman was washing Christ's feet. And Jesus spoke to the woman and said, your sins have been forgiven. Not because she washed his feet. But after the questions around the table, he said to her in verse 50, your faith, your faith has saved you. Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 1 and 2. I could put the whole thing down and we'd love it, but yet we'd be here till noon. It says in Ephesians 1 7, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And then chapter 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. To explain it just a little bit more, and, and some people say, well, you keep going over and over and over again. You know what? Repetition is, is needed here. We take this for granted too often. Faith is the foundation of forgiveness. Sin, I deserve to be punished. Jesus Christ died in my place. Faith, I depend on Christ. Forgiveness, debt canceled. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two and three. Forgiveness stems from humility. It stems from humility. And secondly, forgiveness is stifled by self-righteousness. Humility is admitting that I am a sinner who cannot satisfy God's righteous requirement. And I do not deserve to be forgiven. Or I am a sinner who cannot satisfy God's righteous requirement and does not deserve to be forgiven. To read it correctly. Self-righteousness. And let me say that the church is mis represented in our society oftentimes as being too self-righteous. There are a whole lot of people out there that don't like what we preach and teach as the truth. They don't like it. So we're misrepresented, but yet there are far too many times when the church comes across as being more focused on passing judgment on others than recognizing and admitting my own sins and failure to satisfy God's righteous requirements. And whenever I become more apt to focus on passing judgment rather than recognizing how I will be judged, a problem exists. And just some quick relevant observations about this passage here. Some relevant observations that increase our understanding. First, Jesus used this woman as an example for the Pharisee to follow. How many examples has Jesus placed in your life? Secondly, the Pharisee ignored the reality that she had something, the woman had something, humility, that he needed. And I think we need to stop and look at ourselves and say, is humility in place in my life? Thirdly, it took courage for the woman to go to Simon's house. It took great courage for her to go. Pharisees always shunned people like her. 
when certain movements were started years ago with regard to church growth, and they said, you know what? We need to make churches look less churchy and less religious and less that, you know what? Because people won't darken the door of a church. That's because the reputation is that we shun people. And I don't have any reason to shun anyone because I know that God forgave me from the fact that I am a sinner. And finally, Jesus and Simon were a complete contrast to one another. Complete contrast. Simon was as uppity and nose in the air as possible, and Jesus was as humble as possible. Number four in these relevant realities of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift from God based on His grace. It's based on His grace. From God's perspective, forgiveness is directly connected to salvation, and therefore we can do nothing in our own strength and ability that will earn or deserve His forgiveness. We can do nothing. It's by His grace. Four, jumping to five, forgiveness is a gift from God based on His grace. Therefore, by grace, by grace, my guilt is gone. My guilt is gone. And we need to understand that therefore, forgiveness motivates worship. Forgiveness causes us to say, I want to worship the God that saved me. I want to honor and glorify the God that forgave me. So what do we have here? Just a couple of thoughts here as we close. We need to recognize the relationship between worship and forgiveness. There's a tie. And there are three principles that I think we can apply to our lives. First off, my personal response or my response to being forgiven is directly related to the awareness that I have of my personal sin. Do I see myself as what I really am, a sinner? I know what the psychologists say. They say, you tell them they're sinners, you're going to hurt their image. You're going to hurt their feelings. But the difficulty is, is we don't come to grips with the fact that we're desperately in need of a Savior day in and day out. And I I praise God that I, I don't face condemnation. I'm in Christ Jesus, but I also recognize that I need His help to carry through the day by day activities. And it's also directly related to the awe that I have of God's absolute holiness. His absolute holiness. Is it easier to pass judgment on someone whose sin is obvious than it is to respond to him or her with a sense of understanding? Where's our ministry? Am I unaware or unwilling to acknowledge my own personal sins and therefore less tolerant of the sins of others? My response to being forgiven is directly related to the awareness of the fact that I'm a sinner and I'm awed by God's absolute holiness. Secondly, the more I understand of what I've received from God because my guilt has been removed, the more that I grasp what I've received, the forgiveness, the wondrous blessing of no condemnation, the more I should be motivated to worship Him. The more I should be drawn to attend regularly my church services the more I should be drawn to say, I want to be in God's Word. I want to know God's Word. I want to see what God's Word says. And honestly, when people say, you know what? 
I don't need the church to worship. Hebrews chapter 10, which is in the devotions for a couple weeks from now, tells us that it is absolutely wrong to forsake the gathering of God's people together. The more that I recognize and re rec realize, understand what I've received because of my guilt being removed, the more I'm motivated to worship. Finally, worship involves being preoccupied with the Lord. Being preoccupied with the Lord, that means total devotion and dedication. That means focused concentration. That means being unconcerned about what others might think. This woman walked into enemy territory to wash the feet of Jesus and to show him how much she appreciated the grace that he was showing her. I don't know how she found out. I don't know what was going on that, that precipitated this, but this lady had a firm faith before she walked in the place. And she was preoccupied with the Savior. Are we? Forgiveness. How much does it stir in my heart? Let's pray. Father God, ah, thank you for your forgiveness. I want to pray simply and briefly. Work in our hearts today, God, and help us to recognize the impact and the influence of forgiveness. Give us a preoccupation with our Savior. Give us a lifestyle that is absolutely adoring of who you are and what you've done. Make us magnetic as we walk through this world because we're forgiven and we don't deserve it. And Father, very briefly and simply, if anyone here in this room doesn't understand, if they don't have that sense of assurance, that sense of peace, if they don't have the forgiveness that we're talking about this morning, I ask very explicitly, dear God, help them to find someone else in this place that they can, they can discuss it with them. And they can leave this place with that assurance.